what better way to get started with under 37 than having two 40-year-olds talk to you, <laughs> right? But uh, in fact, um, Peter was once one of you guys. He was, uh, I don't know, how old were you when you found, co-founded PayPal? Uh, 30, 31. 30, 31, okay. <laughs> Didn't quite make the cut. Uh, but I would not have made the cut. Changed money with PayPal, uh, was the first outside investor in Facebook, which we know changed the world. Uh, back Palantir, which is, I, I believe they helped find Osama bin Laden uh, as a big data play, um, and inv invested in uh, SpaceX, so that could change the universe and the galaxy. Um, my first question for you, though, it, and this ties into the ideas in the book, uh, which is very much about thinking differently, and is, is um, what's the one thing they shouldn't listen to you about? You, make, you have this great question in the book. What is the one thing that you know to be true that most people would disagree with you right. on? Right. Yeah. So what, what is that? Well, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of things people shouldn't listen to me about. They probably shouldn't listen to me about fashion advice, or they shouldn't listen about um, all sorts of things I, I don't know that much about. Um, and I, I do think, um, even with respect to starting businesses or uh, in technology, so it's, let's even focusing narrowly on technology startups, um, the uh, the substance of what uh, what people do is uh, is always um, is always unique and different. Uh, I think every moment in the history of business happens only once. You know, the next Mark Zuckerberg won't be starting a social networking site. The next Bill Gates won't start an operating system. Um, you know, the next Elon Musk won't start a Tesla electric car company. Um, and uh, and so. And so, there, and, and so I, I, what, I, what I always push back on uh, really strongly is that there's some kind of straightforward formula, because we're always looking for some sort of pseudo-scientific formula. Um, you know, science starts with the number two, with things that are sort of experimentally repeatable, but, um, but great businesses is, are zero to one. It's, it's, they're always one of a kind. And so there, there is always this anti-formulaic quality, um, and that's why um, that's why I don't have, like, there are a lot of specific things I can't give advice on. The, um, the, 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 the one theme that I always come back to, though, that, that comes out of this anti-formula, formula, out of this one-of-a-kind nature of, of great businesses, is, uh, is this need for differentiation. What are you doing that nobody else is doing? What ideas do you have that nobody else has? What great business are you working on that no one else is working on? And, um, and, and the... And you know, the, 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 the business idea that I come out of it from is that uh, if you're a founder or an entrepreneur, um, you should always aim to build a monopoly where you're the only person in the world doing what you're doing. Um, and I, I, I often think, and this is a little bit extreme, but that there really are only two kinds of businesses in this world. There are businesses that are in crazy competition and there are one-of-a-kind businesses that are monopolies. Mm -hmm. But there's something, there's something, I mean, you've, you've been in and among Silicon Valley for so many years, and some people uh, criticize Silicon Valley for having this, this capsule-like thinking where everything has to be you know, a, a gajillion-dollar company, and which, you know, we love those companies, they're great. But everywhere else in the country, people are starting restaurants and starting you know, warehouse companies, distribution companies that aren't going to be multi-billion-dollar companies, but they're really... For those people, it's their passion and they're excited about it. So the idea, how do you, how do you make sure the ideas in, in your book don't discourage them from at least having some economic interest in what they're doing? Well, um, well I, I actually think you should think twice before starting certain types of businesses. So I think um, there are probably too many bad businesses getting started and not enough good ones. So that's, it's, um, you know, it's, I, don't, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's anything about entrepreneurship per se that is, um, that is, is good. You know, I was talking to one of my friends uh, a few years ago. I was asking him, what do you want to be doing in five or 10 years? Mm. Oh, it's really clear, I want to be an entrepreneur. Mm. That's like saying, I want to be rich, I want to be famous. Um, and I, I don't think, uh, I don't think. Those are, those are good things, being rich and famous. Are good. Um, they're not good as direct goals. Like if, if, you, if you have that as your sole goal, you're unlikely to, I think, really, uh, really succeed. And so I think you become an entrepreneur because you're working on an important problem nobody else is working on. I think you should start a business if you have uh, something, if you're, if, if you're working on a problem that otherwise would not get solved. Without having a lot of you know, you know, world experience, how do you identify that which needs to be done? It certainly is my uh, claim that I think there are many, um, many of these sort of secrets, which I define just as problems that you can solve that no one else has solved yet, or 
um, ideas that are just sort of at the, at the boundary. So I think there are a lot of these uh, things that exist. And I think it's always some combination of um, something that's an important problem. And often, um, often there's some reason people have a blind spot around it or aren't, aren't thinking about it. So I think there's always, I always like to get at it from both a sort of a foundational level, which is some, you know, maybe some substantive area that you're really passionate about, mm -hmm. and, um, and this sort of psychological level of why, why is this something that so many people are missing in one way or, or another. You know, the word, already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both primate and to imitate. And, and uh, you know, we, uh, imitation plays an enormous role. It's how we learn language as kids. It's how culture gets transmitted. But it also leads to a lot of insane behavior. It leads to sort of the madness of crowds. It leads to bubble-like uh, behavior, which we've seen many in our society in recent decades. And so, um, and so I think this um, challenge not to just reflexively imitate and to think for yourself is, um, it's, um, it's always very trivial to say, and it's always in, um, quite hard to, to actually do. Yeah. Um, and, and you also take issue with the way a lot of young companies run. There's, there's, a, there's been a big fad or a trend, uh, an approach uh, of lean startup. I mean, uh, where you, you know, you small teams put out the quickest product you can, get a look at it, get the market to look at it, fix it as you go. Uh, everyone's doing that. You think that's wrong? I think, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think there definitely are things that one can iterate on, but the, the core thing is to have a great product. And then you can always improve and, and iterate on that in all sorts of ways. And I think, you know, I think um, even in, in the tech industry, um, uh, what's striking is how um, weak on a quantitative basis so many of the successful companies were. It was just they had a great product, and then years later, they were able to optimize it in all sorts of, all sorts of ways. Um, whereas if you're just trying to optimize and you don't have a great product, um, I think that, uh, that rarely works. Um, I think it's always worth asking you know, where you're going to go with this business. Um, and so I think we're always focused on very short time horizons because you have to you know, figure out a way to get through the next month, the next quarter. Um, you know, how do you get some customers? How do you, how do you track? But it's, it's always worth thinking ahead you know, five to 10 years. You know, why will this be a really valuable business in five to 10 years? And um, you know, how's the competitive landscape going to develop? How's technology going to develop? How's the world going to develop? Um, these are hard questions to yeah. answer. But I think, um, I, th I think, I think the, uh, the great entrepreneurs that I know always have some perspective on it. And it might be wrong, but it's just, this is what's going to happen. And then, and then it's sort of well-reasoned. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you have a, you have a plan. It, and you know, it's, uh, when, I, when I was playing chess uh, you know, in, in junior high school, one of the early lessons I learned was a bad plan is still always better than no plan at all. Right. And so you know, have a plan. You can always change it. But don't, uh, don't just pretend that, uh, that you have no clue about what's going to happen and that everything about the future is random. If you, if you sort of say that everything's random and out of your control, that's, that's, that's the way you set yourself up for failure. Right. You talk about that as like even as a societal problem in America today. Like we, we are a nation of optimists, but without a definite idea of where we're going, unlike, say, you know, maybe 50 years ago or... Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 the way, it's the way the whole education system works, where you, know, you, you build a resume with you know, a wide uh, variety of activities, and then uh, you go to college, you get some general degree, and then uh, it's supposed to lead to various uh, jobs that lead to other jobs, and it's sort of this, this random walk where you sort of figure out what to do, right. uh, what to do in your future. And, I, and so I do think, um, I do think we, we, we overplay the role of luck. When we, over, when we exaggerate the role of luck in our future, I've, I've, sa I've said, you know, I think luck is like an atheistic word for God, where when we, when we attribute too much to luck, we, um, we stop think we, we could be thinking a little bit more. So you think it's, is it the old hard work you make your own luck, that, that old? That, I like that. Okay. So this whole idea of, well, well, because go back to, because most people in this room, you know, did all the right things. They went to good schools. They had good extracurriculars. They were, you know, captain of the debate team, whatever. You know, a little bit of everything. That's the wrong approach? So people should be the most incredible tuba player ever, or? No, no not necessarily. Uh, but I think, I, I, I think you should be doing something you're passionate about. So the question is always, you know, when I give my younger self advice, you know, uh, if, if, would I still go to Stanford? Would I still go to Stanford Law School? 
um, possibly, but I think a lot more about why I was doing it. Was it, is it just, uh, you know, and I, I was on this super tract for yeah. myself. I ended up at a big law firm in New York. Uh, you know, my eighth grade junior high school yearbook, one of my friends wrote, and I know you're going to get into Stanford in four years. So I went to Stanford four years later, went to Stanford Law School, ended up at a big law firm in, uh, in New York where on the outside everybody wanted to get in, on the inside everybody wanted to get out. <laughs> um, when I left after uh, seven months and three days, um, <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the people uh, down the hall from me said it was you know, really reassuring to see that it was possible to escape from Alcatraz which, you know, all, and all you had to do was really just go out the front door. Mm. But, um, but so much of um, our identity gets wrapped up in the competitions we yeah. win. And, um, that, um, and when, you, when you compete, um, and I think a lot of the credentialing, resume building is this sort of competition. When you compete, you do get better at what you're competing at. You know, if you take lots of SAT test prep classes, you'll get a better score on the SAT. Um, and when you compete, you get better at uh, beating people on the narrow things you need to beat them on. But, um, but you often, it often comes at this very high price of, of losing sight of what's, uh, what's truly valuable and important and meaningful. Which is well, I think passion? There's, well, there's sort of all sorts of other, there are all sorts of things that, mm -hmm. that could be that. But, but I, think, um, I, think it often, the, the, I think it often ends up being uh, something that's a little bit off the beaten path because uh, so I think um, you know there's there's obviously a financial version where you get to be have a monopoly like business. The, there's a the meaningful version I think is always counterfactual where if you weren't doing this uh, would you know it's it's great to be working on problems where if you weren't working on them nobody else would do them. You know if if you're working at the fourth online pet food company, the tenth film solar panel company, mm -hmm. the one thousandth restaurant in Philadelphia. There's a sense that if you weren't doing it, someone else would. Um, you know, if you're working at, uh, at at something where it's the only thing of its kind in the world, that's very meaningful. If, if we weren't, if we were, and it could be for profit, non profit, yeah. all sorts of contexts. If we weren't doing this, this problem would absolutely not be tackled. I think that's the kind of that, that's what's that's what's meaningful. Whereas when you're competing, yeah. you're ready by definition. Um, number two, at least. In a so, did, did, did this? Did this whole when you first met Mark Zuckerberg? Did this? All this? I mean, looking in hindsight, did he encapsulate all the things you're talking about? Was was he doing this because no one else was doing it? He was doing it because he was passionate about it. Was he doing because he had an awesome product? Well, he was. He was incredibly passionate about it. Mm -hmm. um, it was. Uh, you know, there's always because it was the Winklevoss's idea. You know that, right? Uh, I looked into that. It, that's. Well, you, you, you know that, the, that their, their dad was a plaintiff's lawyer. <laughs> so we have to get like, the, some of the details right in these stories. But, um, but I think that, um, I think that uh, there, there often are category, broad categories where you can say, you can say there have been social networks before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my friend Reid Hoffman, I'm starting LinkedIn, started a company in 1997 called SocialNet. So they already had the name in the company seven years before Facebook. Now, their, their idea was that uh, you'd basically have this, uh, this sort of alternate virtual reality where um, you know, maybe I'd be a cat and you'd be a dog, and we'd interact in cyberspace, and we'd have these different rules of how we'd conduct ourselves. Um, and, so the, and I think Facebook was the first one that actually cracked real identity, what was, um, was at its core about, um, about real people. Um, in a way that um, none of the others quite succeeded. Even, even MySpace was more, it started sort of in Los Angeles. It was about people pretending to be someone other than who they are, which is what people do in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, Facebook started at Harvard, where it was, it was sort of basically um, trying to get a map of, of real identity. So right. I think it was the first one to really crack that problem. And, you know, and, and Zuckerberg was you know, very passionate about it. I always, I always say that the, uh, the most important moment in the history of the company was in um, 2006, in July of 06, when Yahoo offered us a billion dollars. Zuckerberg was 22 at the time. He owned a quarter of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a college site. We had maybe 35 million in revenues, no profits. And so we had a board meeting. Three of us met uh, Monday morning. Zuckerberg starts the meeting off saying, well, this is a formality. Obviously, we're going to turn this down. And uh, myself, Jim Breyer, the two investors on the board, both said, you know, we should probably talk about this a little bit more. <laughs> and, um, and so it ended up being not a 10 minute, it ended up being like a six hour long conversation, but it was sort of all about like, well, 
Mark, you'd make a quarter of a billion dollars. There's a lot you could do with this money. Um, and it was, well, I don't know what I'd do with the money. I would just start another social networking site. But, um, but I kind of like the one I have, so why would I get rid of it? Right. And, um, and at the end of the day, the, 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 key, the key point that, uh, that Mark made was that there were a whole set of products that Facebook was still planning to build, so not just iterating, uh, that it was planning to build that surely Yahoo was not valuing properly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he was, he was right. I mean, these th the future is never valued. Right. these things. When, and when you talk about important moments in the lives of companies, because a lot of people here are starting companies or ventures with people they either maybe know or don't know that well, you, you talk about in the book about the, the importance of picking the right founder, the right person to go in with, and it's not usually the one you might think is the right person. Well, I think it's, um, I think it's generally a good much better to do it with people you know well. You can sort of, there's some debates about whether it's good to do it with your best friends or yeah, not. Yeah. But, um, but I think it's generally a bad idea to do it with people you don't know at all. So you know, it's sort of, I always like asking people the prehistory question. What, um, you know, how did the, the two or three people who founded a company, how did, how did you meet, how did, how did it come together? The, um, the bad answer is we met at a social network, at a networking function a week ago and decided to start a company because we both wanted to be entrepreneurs. Um, good answer is something like, um, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this for a number of years, thinking about it in one way or another, and, uh, and sort of uh, pulled it together.